Jesus, your King. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. In power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. There is wonderful power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Yes? How do you know that? How do I know that? The very fact that I'm standing in front of you to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus is more than adequate proof of God's uh, amazing power yeah. and the blood of the Lamb that washes away all the filth and dross and contaminations that your soul and mine. That's, that's power, good people. Yeah? yeah. And uh, it just so happens that in our lesson today we will address some matters relating to that power. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Lord's Church, the Churches of Christ. As Paul says in Romans 16 and verse 16, the Churches of Christ salute you. That means we greet you. We greet you in the powerful name of our Savior Jesus Christ. Yes? And we greet you and welcome you into our fellowship and into our worship service. Yeah? Whether you are near or far, we are grateful to God that you have joined us at this time. Our reading is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through to 7. And the, the, key, the key verse, really, verse number 3, which says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has done an amazing thing. What is it he has done? Who has blessed us. In Christ Jesus, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place. You know, that's what God has done for you. That's what God has done for everyone who has been washed in the blood of Christ. That's what God has done for the church that Jesus built. What did he do? He has blessed us with everything. Are you with me? With everything. But those blessings are located in a spiritual realm, and the realm is uh, in Christ Jesus. Yeah? In Christ. That's heaven's description of where Christ is physically or uh, presently located. Wherever Christ is, that's heaven. That's what we mean by heaven. Heaven is not a physical place. In relating to us in a language that we can understand, it may be worded in such a way that you can visualize it. So, for instance, uh, John tells us that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he was caught up into heaven. And he saw things. Well, you know, seeing is a physical uh, activity. So it means, therefore, that the language is used to help us to appreciate and to understand and to come to grips with what the apostle experienced when he was caught up. <laughs> when he was in the spirit. 
is going to be taken into that spiritual zone. And that spiritual zone, in other respects, respects is described to us as being in Christ. And that is a recurring phrase in the book of Ephesians, about 14 times it is repeated there. The title of our lesson this morning is that our everything is in Christ. You know, John also spoke to this. He says, God has blessed us or provided us with everything that pertains to life and godliness. All of that is answering a practical question which many times we don't ask. We don't verbalize it. We may think it, but we don't verbalize it. You know, in sales, you know, if you're a salesman, a car salesman, or you're selling books, or you're selling furniture, or you're selling whatever it is that you're selling, your customer comes around and you make your presentation and you tell them how wonderful their product is and so on and so forth. But you know what grips the customer? is when you can say to the customer, this is what is in it for you. Or, you can ask, well, what am I getting out of it? What's in it for me? So here is Jesus' system. Yes, an amazing system. He has done a lot to, to bring it into reality. He came into a world, he taught the gospel, he built his church, he set up his apostles, and he says, go and convert the world. And as we do that, we meet very various kinds of persons, and we try to teach them the gospel. But you know, people want to know, what is in it for me? What am I going to get out of it? What are the benefits that accrue to me? When I give my life to Jesus Christ. Yeah? So the way, or one of the ways that your Bible answers that, is to say, look at what is in store for you. Look at what God is doing for you at this very moment. From the very moment that you obey the gospel of Christ, your entire life changed beyond your imagination. And the Apostle Paul, in bringing that to us, he used the phrase, in Christ. In John 15 and verse 18, Jesus says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is. You do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. So what inspiration is saying to us is this. When we become a Christian, when we are born again by God's great amazing power, yes, there is a transformation that, uh, that happens. There is a movement, there is a spiritual movement where we are relocated. Yeah? If you were to talk with certain people over in Afghanistan at this time, they can tell you about what it means to be relocated. <laughs> Are you with me? To be taken from one country to another because uh, millions or thousands of them at this moment want to be relocated. Well, in the broader scope of things, Jesus Christ, in a conversation with the Father and the Holy Spirit in the long, long ago, they determined that the inhabitants of planet Earth are to be, are needed to be relocated. Why? Because the planet is corrupt, given over to sin, and the inhabitants of the planet have been contaminated by the virus of sin. And the virus of sin uh, destroys the soul. It destroys your humanity. It destroys who you are. So that soul needs saving. And in the wisdom of God, it says, well, yes, but to save humanity, they have to be relocated. They have to 
be taken from that physical realm into a spiritual realm. And that spiritual realm is described in the two words in Christ. So Jesus says to us in John 15 and verse 18, if you are not in Christ, you are in the world. And in the world carries a certain kind of worldly experience. Yes? So the world, we still physically live in the world. But spiritually, we are in that spiritual realm in Christ. So we are, we are in two, two realms, yes? So Jesus says, understand this. As a child of God who is in Christ, you are going to have certain experiences in the world. But remember, the world is not your home. Yeah? The world is not your habitation. In the world, you will have pain and suffering and anguish. In the world, you will be hated by worldlings. In the world, you will be ridiculed, ostracized, taunted. Yeah? For many reasons, one of which is just because you are different. But in Christ, in Christ, that's where your hope lies. That's where your happiness is going to be found. So bless be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You know, it is so common to hear the response from people when you ask, uh, how are you? And they say, I am blessed. But you know, in reality, it's just words. Because folks don't understand what they are saying. You are only blessed if and when you are in Christ. That simply means if you haven't obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're not blessed. You're still under the curse of the world because you are living in the world and you will continue there until Jesus Christ takes you out and transports you into the spiritual realm in Christ. And that movement will not take place until you have submitted your life in obedience to Jesus Christ, obeying his gospel. Yeah? yeah? But here this morning, as we consider now the in Christ, what's in it for me? And heaven says, think about your life in Christ. You know, our brother Derek this morning says that, you know, he and his wife had a little conversation about uh, the storm if it comes. What they're going to do? He says, we'll go to church. That's what we do. That's right. My family, they would expect me, storm or no storm, they would expect me to be here this morning. If the road is blocked, they'll expect me to walk around it. Yeah, that's just how they are. <laughs> you will know why? Because we have tasted the goodness of God. <laughs> we have experienced God. And when we experience God, there's, then it, it takes a lot to keep you away from your meeting with God. Yeah? So in Christ, that's what is in it for us. That's what is in it for me. Living in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, it says, God raised us up with him, that is with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And then John, as he was caught up to look into the throne room of God in heaven in Revelation 4 and verse 1, he says, after this I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and behold a throne stood in heaven and one seated on the throne. You notice that the text, John says that I was in the spirit. He had to be transformed from the physical to the spiritual so as to experience uh, the heavenly realm. <laughs> he had to be transformed. So in the spirit he looked, he saw a throne 
in heaven with one seated on the throne. And as he continues in the book, he describes the throne room. He speaks about the elders, yes? And, and the, the, the seraphims and all of those heavenly creatures that were surrounded, that were that surrounded the throne of God and the Lamb of God, Jesus the Christ, uh, seated there at his right hand, and you know, he gives you that description. One of the reasons for that description that I bring to you this morning is just the notion that you should cultivate and keep that you will be among that throng of humans around the throne of God. And just think about it. Think about it. Think about sitting or standing, just being placed in this room. And in the middle of the room, is God Almighty. <laughs> you, 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 you know, you, that's what is in it for us. That's what it means to be blessed. Yeah? To be elevated into a status that is beyond us. Because in Christ, as we continue, in Christ is a meeting place. Yeah? It's a dating place. I was hoping today would be a very special dating place for my wife and I, you know, because she, she just had a wonderful milestone in her life. Yesterday, August the 21st, was her 45th anniversary, wedding anniversary. That's right, 45 years. She doesn't look that old, but, you know. Yeah, she's been married to Lancelot for 45 years. And, um, uh, you know, we went on many dates. I was a dating kind of guy. You know that way? I like dates. Yeah. I like to go nice places for a date. Yeah. A date is a meeting place. But you know, the, the, the most exciting part of about a date for me was not even the date itself. It's just the invitation for the date. Would they like to go with me? <laughs> And you hear what? Yes! All right. <laughs> yeah, you will experience that yet, my friend. <laughs> yes! She said yes! Oh, man. And then, you know, you know, you get into your cultural uh, things to turn up for that date. Yeah? You dress well. Perfume your body and yourself. Yeah? Make sure that you are up to date with your with your tags, with your clothing, yeah? And uh, you want to be looking your best. Put your best foot forward. Well, I'm going on a date. A date involves a meeting place. That's where we're gonna meet. Well, think about God calling you on a date. He has set a place for us to meet with him. Yeah? And in this meeting place, a, transform a transformation has to take first take place. The sinner has to be the saint. Yeah? The old sinful you and me has to become sinless. Why? Because we are going on a date with God. The second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 tells you, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And as a new person in Christ, we can appear before God. We can appear before the presence of God. We can be seated at the table of God. Yeah? That's what is in Christ. That's what it is. That's what is in it for me and for you. Think a little bit about the meeting places that God has used to help us to concretize the concept of us meeting with God. In Exodus chapter 19, God tells Moses, He says, 
Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. Now notice, notice what God says to Moses to go and tell Israel. You see, Israel had sent word to God that said, hey, all that you say to do, we will do it. So God says, okay, that's a good start. So now we're going to go on a date. There's going to be a, we're going to, I'm going to meet with you. But for that meeting to take, before that meeting, consecrate yourself. Take two days, there's a lot of people. And let them wash their garments. And be ready. <laughs> you know, if, why are you going to do that? Because you're going on a date with God. You have to be right. Spiritually, and in this instance, uh, physically also. You can't appear before God with dirty clothes. Yeah. So on the morning, Exodus 19, 16, of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Where was the Mount Beaten place? At the foot of the mountain. <laughs> you get that? Yeah. You know, all of the, 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 the trumpet blast and the smoke and the, the, the earthquake and all of that was just that the people know that, guess what? God is coming. <laughs> yeah. The meeting is about to begin. The trumpets blew. All of that. You know? In today's, in, in today's political arena, have you ever noticed that uh, when there's a big meeting with the president, yeah? That the people come together and they're waiting in anticipation and expectation and they set up the platform and everything is there and it's ready and when it is ready then you have uh, the town crier. That's what we used to call that person. I don't know what is the term they give him today but you know he comes out ahead and he says uh, what does he say? Ladies and gentlemen the president of the United States of America yeah? Audience stands and you applaud. How it comes, uh, Mrs. President or Mr. President. Yeah? There's that announcement. So with God and Israel at the foot of the mountain, there was this announcement. The people stood at the foot of the mountain. So that was one meeting place. Another meeting place we are told about is in Exodus chapter 29 and verse 42, where it says uh, that this place shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak to you there. There I will meet with the people of Israel and it shall be sanctified by my glory. Notice that this meeting place now, they have left the mountain. They are now in the, in the, making their journey to the promised land. There's a tent of meeting. What do you mean by a tent of meeting? There's a tent where we will meet. Yeah? And the text says in verse 4 and 3, There I will meet with the people of Israel. You know, the thing about a meeting place, one, you want to be, you need to turn up. If you don't turn up, you're not going to be a part of that meeting. And secondly, you have to be on time. <laughs> are you, are you, <laughs> you know, you know, you know we, we had a lovely ladies day yesterday. Congratulations to all the sisters for doing an amazing job. And I encourage all the men to listen to the presentations that that ladies day there is recorded. It is on the church website and it is also on YouTube. Yeah. But you know, that original meeting was from 10 a.m. until about midday. So I set it up on my computer with Zoom. They did this time. I went about my business and came back at about 
five minutes to twelve, and the, the meeting was over. And then I look in the chat, and there was this person says, "Hey, am I late for the meeting?" <laughs> you know, I said, "I said I, I will restart it for you." So I did. So about seven persons. They came to that meeting late, two hours late. In this instance, it was no big deal. We just simply restarted the video and they went through it. But in meeting with God, good people, you and I, make sure you are on time. Yeah? So, the tent of meeting was where God said he will meet with Israel. Prior, he met at the foot of the mountain. Yeah? And then, as we come to the Come now to the New Testament. Ephesians 1 and verse 3 tells us though that God meets with us in Christ. <laughs> you with me? That's the meeting place. In Christ that is also in his church. John 1 and verse 12 tells us to all who did receive him, that is Christ, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The right to become children of God. That is the introduction that has to, we must go through to become a child of God. You're not a child of God when you believe in Jesus Christ. You're on the right path. But there's more work to be done. Galatians 3.26 tells us how it is concluded. For in Christ Jesus, you notice the in Christ Jesus? For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Why is that so? Verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I always like to draw attention to the prepositions there, yeah? The distinction between, okay? The preposition in Christ, you see that in? Very important, that's location. And you are baptized into, you see that into? Into is different from in. In is a fixed location. Into is a movement. <laughs> yeah. Into takes you from out of and it relocates you in. Before you can be in, you first have to pass through the into. Move from the out of into is that movement. It's like a transport. And when into ends, it leaves you in. Yeah? It leaves you in. See that I, yeah, there you go. It leaves you in. So here, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, pays attention, draws our attention to the two prepositions. In Christ Jesus, you are sons of God. When you are in Christ, you are a child of God. How did you get to be located in Christ? Verse 27. As many of you as were baptized into Christ. So your baptism was the vehicle, the 747 jet, the Lexus motor car, yeah? The Long Island train, whatever it is, is that vehicle. Baptism is like that vehicle that takes you from being outside of Christ and it locates you, or we should say relocate you in Christ. Now that you are in Christ, you are a son and daughter of God. And in Christ, Romans 8 and verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who are where? In Christ Jesus. Why? For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Okay. Third point. In Christ, furthermore, is a, 
It's a meeting place. You see that, yeah? It's a blessing place. It's a meeting place. And it is also the cleanup place. <laughs> yeah. That's a cleanup place. <laughs> it's the shower. It's the bath. It's the lake. It's, it's that place where we get clean. We are cleansed. And we stay clean. Ephesians 1 and verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, uh, where he hath made us accepted in the beloved. So that's the work of Christ Jesus. He makes us acceptable. <laughs> Are you with me? You know, you remember the story of the prodigal son? When he returned to his father? Yeah? The story began where he left home. He left home as a prince, well decked out, finest garments and jewelry and all of that. How did he return? He returned as a bum. Yeah. And what did the father say? Hey, get shoes, put on his feet. He came home barefooted. <laughs> put a ring on his feet, dress him up, clean him up, make him presentable. That's what the Father does with us. He has made us presentable. Yeah? And that's one of the reasons Acts 22 and verse 16 is worded that way. And now, why do you wait? Get up, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Or calling on his name. Be clean. That's what Christ is doing. He's making us presentable. To God. So he cleanses us. In a, uh, 1 John chapter 1, uh, verses 8 and 9, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself, the truth is not in us. But if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Yeah? In Christ, in the cleaner place, that's where we are made clean. You cannot be made clean outside of Christ. Doesn't work that way. It can't be done. Yeah? So you are rising, you are baptized, you are cleansed, and in that cleansing, you are placed in the bloodstream of Jesus Christ, which continually washes and cleanses you. We like to uh, put Revelation 1 and verse 5 alongside Acts 22, 16, so that we clarify that misunderstanding and talk of people who don't know better, who would like to think that we are preaching that the water in which you are baptized is what cleanses your sin. Nothing could be further from the truth. So Revelation 1 and verse 5 says, from Jesus Christ who is a faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Yeah. We are made clean in Christ. So Ephesians 1 and verse 7. In him, that's in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Yeah? So in Christ is a, is a cleaner place. A cleansing. You like to feel clean? Have you ever noticed how refreshing and something happens to you when you've had a long, heavy day and you're all sweaty and all of that and you go in and I take a shower. And you're not in any hurry. <laughs> you know that kind of shower. Yeah? Oh, when you come out of the shower, you feel so good. Ah, you're clean. Clean up yourself. In my premarital home counseling, many times I tell husbands to be, say, hey, when you become a husband, yeah? But clean up yourself before you go to bed. I know that's a difference. <laughs> Woo! I won't say anything about that. In Ephesians 1 and verse 18, here's what the apostle writes now. Final point. In Christ is also the place of power. Power is the ability to do, to get things done. Power is about accomplishment. In Christ is the power place. 
Ephesians 1 and verse 18, that you may know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. Power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. That's the word power. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Yeah? That power is at work within us. Yeah? That power. Ephesians 1.13 in him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise, with the promised Holy Spirit. We were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The power of God resides within us. We are in that power. And because we are in that power, the Apostle Paul could write in Philippians 4 and verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who empowers me. Yeah? We have the power to accomplish things. Look at the Apostles. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. So these 12 young men, just think about what Christ did to these 12 young men. He asked them to do the impossible. He says to them, Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, All power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the very end of the word. But then he said to them, Go and convert the world. Preach the gospel to heaven, person and planet earth. And as amazing as it sounds, the Apostle Paul writes and he says, the gospel has been preached to every person on the planet. Yeah? Some of our theologians and others says that has to be a mistake. So it's not to the whole world. It is to the then known world. I think about it. I said, hey, God Almighty knows every corner of this world. So when he said to them, go into all the world, nowhere was excluded. Yeah? And you and I, look how far and distant we are from the giving of that commission to those 12 young men, given about 2,000 years ago. And here we are as converts to Jesus Christ. What enabled them to do that? Because resident in them was the power, the Holy Spirit. And that same power is in your heart, lives, resides, dwells in you. So in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, now unto him who is able, that's the word power, to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. That power is at work within the child of God, within the Christian, within the church that Jesus built. So there is no obstacle that we cannot overcome. There is no goal that we cannot achieve. The power is with us. Yeah. So let us thank God and ask God to reveal his will for us. Say, Lord, what is the work that you want us to do in my community, in my home, in my country? And let us get to it. Why? Wow. The power is with us. 
The power is in us. So that's the lesson. Our everything is in Christ. Your greatest aspirations, whatever they may be, the best life that you could possibly live, fulfilled, satisfying, rewarding, wonderful, the best for you as a child of God is in Christ Jesus. May God bless us with his presence and his power that we remain there. So we looked at in Christ a spiritual place, a meeting place, a clean up place, and a place of power. So the question to you at this time is this. Are you ready to begin living in Christ? In fellowship with God? In fellowship with Jesus Christ, your Savior? And if your answer is yes, then you have to obey the gospel of Christ. You believe in him, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and obey his command to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. We encourage you to do that and to do that today. I'm here to help you to come to a better understanding of the gospel of Christ. So I'll be happy to sit with you so we can open our Bibles and share the unsearchable riches of Christ in his word. If you'd like to have that personalized Bible study, just let me know and we will do what needs to be done. Let's have a Bible study together. If you're having some issues in your life, we'll be happy to pray with you and to pray for you. There is power in our prayers. God is with us. He answers our prayers. It's a life-changing experience. Okay? So we're going to stand and sing the invitation song. And while we do this, we invite you to make that response that puts you in a right relationship with God. Even now, as we begin. All of prayers we have in